Transformers Fallen Home Chapter 2 Sparks of Youth Bulby suddenly awoke to the shattering sound of thunder from outside. The Autobot narrowly fell off his seat, though he then jolted into an upright position. Looking upwards, B went through the satin blue fluorescent lights above himself that illuminated the interior. They doused a hefty amount of uncertainty upon his small form, as from that moment, B recalled where he was and what he was doing. Both him and RC were tasked by Optimus to find the Autobot named Grimlock along with his crew. Bumblebee didn't know these bots personally, but their tales of being brutal fighters were always carried throughout the minds of Iacon. It was always told that Grimlock and his team were gladiators that became large and hefty vehicles, all designed for rough battles. When the war began, however, Grimlock and the rest joined the Autobots, believing that everyone should have been free to choose for themselves. Sure, they were beastly beings, but they all had sparks of gold within. Drone, you are right. A croaked elder's voice boomed aloud from the speakers aligned along the walls. That's right, Bowie recalled. Both him and RC were being transported by a large Autobot by the name of Jetfire. Literally. They were being transported by him within his alien cargo plane mode. It felt... odd to be carried by another Autobot by the likes of Jetfire, Bowie thought to himself. But man, was it cool. Yeah, I'm okay. Thunder awoke me is all. Uh, thanks, Jetfire. The Autobot scout softly thanked in an awkward tone, but was met with no reply. For all that met his audio receptors were the sounds of rain and thunder pelting against the metal, alongside the muffled cry of several engines. Leaning back, Bombi looked to the ceiling, lost in thought, wondering about how this would go. That was, until he looked to his left, seeing his quote-unquote partner sitting several seats away from him, looking what could only be described as sad. R.C. sat slumped, her back arched down against the metallic station seat. Her legs were bent up and tucked into her chest. The young bot's battle mask was still, to be surprised, deployed around her face, latched on tightly like a heavy layer of makeup. Although it was hard to make out, Bumblebee could see her tired and strained optics beneath, just staring off in the space. She just seemed so empty and lost. He didn't know how else to describe it. Gently, the small yellow Autobot stood up from his seat and walked his way over towards the one he couldn't really call a friend just yet. The two barely knew one another outside their names, so it was odd to be stationed with a stranger, Bumblebee thought. Within a short few moments, the Autobot scout stood next to the slumped RC, who paid the bee drone little to no mind. It was as though he wasn't even really there. Yet, after an awkward moment, B looked from both his sides until gently sitting in the seat beside R.C. As he did so, the dusty red Autobot quietly glanced her optics towards him before looking back forward, not saying a word. Noticing this, Bomi took his chance and began to try and spark up a friendly conversation. Hi. Um, I haven't properly introduced myself yet. The name's B-127. I... You, you probably knew that, but you can call me Bumblebee. Yellowbot introduced with a gleeful expression whilst reaching his hand out, expecting a return greeting shake. RC, however, merely looked to B from behind the mask, with a look of what seemed to be irritation. Uh, RC. Upon hearing RC's words, Bumblebee's optics suddenly lit up along with his newly repaired door wings. In an odd way, he had fully expected her just to remain silent, but it seemed as though there was some sense of conversation to be had after all. It was only after a quiet and awkward few seconds when Bumblebee noticed that his hand was still outstretched and unshaken. Quickly, he curled his fingers into a gentle fist before dropping his arm altogether, feeling more awkward than ever before. Now he himself was looking forward. Hey, uh, I'm really sorry about your friend Braun. I'm sure he was a great bot. I, I didn't know him, but... <sighs> Bumblebee tried to persuade his care of the RC. He always hated when there was seemingly nothing he could do to help. In his spark, B always wanted to look out for those he would consider as friends. 
However, it was never returned, not once in his life, which motivated him even more to simply just try. Listen, Drone. I really don't want to be on this mission. I don't have much to say. Nor what to say. So, please, just leave me be. Alright? R.C. returned with a tired-sounding voice before leaning her head back upon her knees and looking away from Bumblebee. Silently, B narrowed his gaze away, eyes softening and door wings lowering. Yellow Autobot Scout then wrapped both his hands together and leaned forward, looking down at the floor and tapping his foot. Already making a great first impression. <sighs> You're kidding yourself. This ain't working. And if she doesn't want to talk, then maybe try later, dude. B quietly said within, reminiscing on how strange of a bot he was. He was always too quick to ask and always too late to try again, was what the scout was thinking, so he heard the faint sound of music. Craning his head back to RC, the small Autobot could hear a familiar tune playing within RC's helmet. She was listening to a catchy beat that once played from time to time within the mines. He and his co-drones would always hum along and tune their radios into its frequency. Simpler, or rather, better times, be recalled. Hey, that's a good song you're listening to there. The scout softly told R.C. with a slight perk up in his wings. Gently, R.C. turned her head back to Bumblebee, looking to him with her tired optics, now confused. What? How can you... R.C. quietly asked to the small drone while thinking to herself. I really need to start turning my music down. Oh, I'm a bee drone. Bee station? BB music? We're naturally intertwined with radio frequencies. You know, call support from within the mines. Uh, uh, sorry if it seemed like I was eavesdropping. It's, it's just a great song. Reminds me of times before, uh, you know, all this. Squinting, R.C. furrowed her brow and got ready to speak again. That was until Jetfire's voice boomed from within his own system, alerting the two scouts inside. I were about to head over Grimlock's last known location. Are you two ready to jump? Quickly but silently, R.C. stood to her feet and stretched, passing Bumblebee's height by four entire feet. Her dented door wings propped up while she adjusted her form with a resounding mechanical pop. Ready as ever. She finished before looking down the Bumblebee with unamused eyes. Without saying a word, B stood to his feet as well and looked to R.C. with a strange gaze. The two bots locked eyes without saying a single word, oddly entranced within one another. In that moment, however, the back hatch to Jetfire's plane mode slowly opened. The blue lights around them changed hues to a red glow, signifying that the drop port was now ready. Good luck, you two! And if you find them, tell Grimlock he still owes me some Energon pints! Jetfire yelled as the hatch opened fully revealing the stormy clouded abyss for the two bots to see. All right, follow my lead. R.C. commanded with a now firm voice. We jump on three, two. Before she could finish, however, Bumblebee got a small idea to try and lighten the mood. On instinct, the small yellow Autobot rushed ahead, exclaiming, Last one to land is a rotten con! Then, with one turn and leap, Bulby jumped off the plane hatch and entered it into a backward angle skydive, giving RC a playful glare dropping below. Scowling in annoyance beneath her mask, RC quickly rushed forward and leapt out of jet fire as well, entering into a nosedive within the cold and stormy sky. <sighs> I must give me strength. She mumbled before entering a free fall, following Bumblebee. Descending quickly, Bulby deployed his battle mask while the ground began to make its way in the view. It was a muddy, metallic landscape filled with rusting puddles and sharp, spindly mechanical pillars. Dying Cybertronian trees and plant life sprouted from these grounds, having cables that acted as vines to flaking off shards of fiberglass that resembled our very own leaves. This place was once the blooming plant city utopia called Stanix, now a crumbled and abandoned war-torn land simply referred to as the Acid Wastes. 
Taking notice of a leaning building nearby, Bulby rose his right arm back and activated a glowing green arm blade from underneath the roof of his hand. Quickly, he jammed its burning end into the building's side and slid down. Sparks and the crunching sound of tearing metal then filled the scout's audio receptors, all until he at last retracted his blade and landed to the ground with a muddy splash. Ugh. Nailed it! B congratulated himself before he turned himself around and looked to the sky, watching as the outline of RC quickly descended like a falling angel. The young bot didn't even bother with slowing her fall, for she simply did a quick mid-air front flip and landed with a hard splash, hunched over, but still upright on both feet. Retracting his blade and battle mask, Bombi gave an impressed look to his quote-unquote companion, watching as she stood back to her full height and flicked a speck of mud off her shoulder. Whoa. <laughs> okay, I won, but well, that entrance was awesome. Round two sometime? B asked with an upbeat tone as RC simply walked past him, paying no mind. This isn't time for games, drone. Stop acting like a teenager and let's find those bots. RC barked in an irritated voice before using her visor to light the way within the storm. Wait, aren't you a teenager though? Bombi asked out of curiosity as he followed his reluctant partner. Your voice ain't that deep like the others. Plus, you appear to be in your prime, no pun intended. And I don't see a speck of rust on you. To top it off, what you did back there a few seconds ago was some genuine athletic skills. Count me jealous. Groaning, RC looked behind herself at Balby, who gazed back upon her with his bright blue puppy dog eyes. She was beginning to question why the scout was just so carefree and unfazed. Here they were, walking through the middle of a thunderstorm, searching for missing soldiers, and covered in mud. Yet Bumblebee was just casually talking to her like a friend you'd see at the mall. What was with him, she thought. Did you not hear me on the plane? I don't really want to talk, okay? I don't know you, and you don't know me. So let's just find Grimlock and get back to base. Maybe then we can find a home that isn't this scrap-infested mud slogger. R.C. snapped back before transforming into her dirty red and white vehicle mode, proceeding to drive ahead and leaving B in the mud. <laughs> Sighing, Balmby flicked off some of this matter before he knelt down and transformed into a roundly curved yellow mining vehicle, accompanied with a drill at the front of his bumper. The bot then revved his engine and skidded forward, gaining up on R.C. and making the two parallel from the rain. Hey, look, uh, sorry if I'm being annoying, it's, it's just been a while since I've, well, it's been a while since I've had a partner or anyone to talk to with, as a matter of fact. Balby explained as the two stayed lane level, continuing along the muddy pathway. Now, thinking on it, I actually don't know if I've really ever had a full-blown conversation that wasn't about drills or energon tunnels. The scout continued, remembering his life as an Energon miner before the war. You know, when all this started, I I thought joining the Autobot could give me the freedom to be myself and get to, well, you know, get to know others. Be more than just a simple, simple waste of a drone. Balmy then stopped talking for a moment, realizing that he was starting to spill out some kind of sob story. He then composed himself before speaking again. Eh, never mind. I'll, uh, I'll shut up if it makes you happy. But if you need someone to talk to, I'll, I'll be right here for the rest of the mission. Be finished, sounding slightly optimistic. That was the best way RC could describe the scout. Optimistic. He was a drone who sounded like he could have been on top of the world. It was odd, yet oddly comforting in a way. After a long moment of silence... R.C. slowed her engine and entered into a smooth drive, with Bumblebee following her motion. She held her tongue for a moment, until finally, she spoke. I... Look, I'm sorry if I've been coming off as rude. It's just been a long time since someone tried speaking, well, normally towards me. R.C. revealed in her tired state of mind, as she glanced at Bumblebee through her mirrors. The last time I was around someone my age was when the war began. His name was Tailgate. 
when we were the Decepticons, they... I think you can piece it together. The two then round a corner filled with vast amounts of trees and hanging wires that were illuminated by their headlights along with the sparks of green lightning that rattled above. As the lightning flashed, it revealed a set of towers in the far-off distance. This was where Grimlock's location was last pinned, according to his whereabout finder. I'm... I'm so sorry for your loss. Balmy returned, the two now slowing down. After it all happened, I joined the Autobots. I was only 13 cybercycles old. And to say it weighed on me would be an understatement. I've lost countless friends and people I saw as family. All lost to the Decepticons. It's left me numb to say the least. The Autobot pair were now slowly trekking their way through the mud and rain, simply just talking, genuinely talking to one another, something the two of them hadn't had in a long, long time. I... I just want to get off this middle rock and restart, you know? I just want to get away from everything and everyone. I'm just scared of getting attacked and losing again. Which is why I... Scrap. Here I am again, making bonds. R.C. then shut her mouth and transformed as the two now neared a massive metal barrier that led inside one of the towers. Following suit, B transformed as well and looked to R.C., still having her battle mass activated. Hey, I get it. You're scared of losing another friend. But you and I made it this far, right? I mean, look at me. I'm still healthy and alive as ever. Bombi explained in his carefree tone, beginning to hop up and down and playfully punch the air like he was boxing someone. <laughs> no Decepticon's gonna squash this bug. No way, no how. And trust me when I tell you that I plan to keep that way. Looking down, Harsey crossed her arms, and although Bumblebee couldn't see it, behind the orange glow of her mask, a tiny smile formed upon her face for the first time in a very long time. Hey, let's make a deal. Let's, uh, let's look out for each other. You watch my back, and I'll watch yours. Bumblebee suggested before raising his fist forward, gesturing for R.C. the bump it. Come on, kids like us gotta stick together. What you say, see? Partners? After a short moment, R.C. lowered her head inside before she rose her hand up and gently fist bumped Bumblebee with a playful roll in her optics. <laughs> Alright then, let's roll, Bumblebee. R.C. said, smiling beneath her mask. For the first time in a while, she felt something inside her spark that gave her a sense of compassion. The young scout's kind and carefree soul reached hers in a way that she couldn't deny. It was a nice feeling. Cool, now let's find those gladiators. Bumblebee exclaimed with his playful attitude before turning to the tower doors and opening their hatches. Slowly, they creaked their sides, revealing the interior to the broken building. It was damp and empty, while at the same time, slightly threatening. Seeing this, the two Autobots activated their respective weapons, RC with their triple striker blasters, and Bumblebee with his battle mask and arm cannons. Without saying a word, they both entered inside, ready to find the team of Autobots. Slowly trekking across the cold seal floor, the two Autobots were able to gaze into the darkness through their built-in visors, allowing them to see... chaos. The building's interior had been completely dismantled. Monitors and power cores were strewn across the floor like a tipped-over box of tools. Paintings and furniture were smashed and destroyed, almost beyond recognition. And finally, the bodies of Decepticons that had long since passed. Their lifeless forms were destroyed and mangled, a gruesome fate that one could wish to only feel in nightmares. Whoa, what happened here? Bumblebee asked as he awkwardly stepped over one of the slain Decepticons. Grimlock and his team, that's what happened. R.C. answered in a soft and disturbed tone of voice as she looked to the barbaric after effects laying before herself. The duo then slowly looked upward as a glimmer of lightning caught their optics. 
Not too far off in their pathway was a torn open chunk of wall that was led by a trail of parts. Seeing this, the two carefully made their way towards the broken metal opening. Both Balmy and RC felt uneased as they stepped through them, finding themselves in what looked to have once been a park or city garden. Withering metal trees spun towards the sky in dying spindly angles, making them look to be grasping hands reaching for the stars above. Their thin glass leaves slowly drifted to the wet ground below, making both RC and Bumblebee feel sad within their steps. I don't understand, Megatron. Bumblebee stated aloud as the two walked side by side through the park. Wasn't his motto originally that freedom was everyone's right? B asked, looking to RC. It was, until he became a monster. She returned, brushing the remaining glass leaves above her head. Now why does Optimus say it so often? Isn't that a little, you know, odd? The scout continued as he scanned for Decepticons with his visor. Optimus and Megatron were once allies. The two of them originally strived for freedom between all Cybertronians. But, over time, Megatron's efforts grew more and more, well, tyrannical. R.C. elaborated as she looked back forward, remembering being a lot younger when the debates between Orion Pax and Megatron were at an all-time high. Megatron soon chose violence over peace, something that Optimus, well, Orion at the time, couldn't side with. They became political enemies for a long time. But when the Council saw that Orion packs to be most fit for being a Prime, Megatron and his followers snapped and attacked. So now, Optimus uses that phrase to remind us what we're fighting for. Megatron taught him that. Or who Megatron once was. RC finished, spiking Bumblebee's interest tenfold. The Autobot Scout looked from her, and then back forward. B's mind was ticking like a clock. So many questions, too many to answer. Say, how... how do you know all that? The Yellowbot asked while side-glancing back to RC. <laughs> Clearly you haven't been to any of Prime's speeches. RC replied in a sarcastic yet sassy tone of voice that made the scout slightly chuckle. <laughs> okay, yeah, you, you got me on that one. I've never actually been front and center to... Well, wait a second. You see that? Bumblebee suddenly cut himself off mid-sentence as his attention was drawn past R.C.'s view. Raising her mechanical eyebrow, she turned to see what Bumblebee was referring to. There, not too far off in the distance, was what looked to be some kind of torn open pathway. The only reason B was able to notice it was due to the burning embers that danced from its open side. The destruction looked almost, if not identical, to the open wall they had exited through just a few minutes ago. Without saying a word, the two bots turned and made quick work in making their way over. It was yet another door, but this time, it led down into what seemed to be an empty chasm. No, it was an elevator chute, with no elevator. Whoa, what in Primus's name happened here? B asked as he looked down into the dark abyss. Raising her arm, RC opened a flap to emanate a holographic outline, showing the directions of Grimlock's last known location. To her utmost shock, it looked to have moved downward below the surface. Knowing what to do, RC took a step forward and dropped down, with Bumblebee quickly following close behind. Falling downwards, the two Autobots found themselves to be descending faster than predicted. It almost felt as though minutes had gone by, which could have only been seconds. Their fall soon came to a stop, however, once the both of them made a splashdown within a murky, vast array of machines and technical devices. It was a sewer system, both RC and B realized, while getting back to their feet. Not just that, it was as though it were a giant lab. Strange glowing tubes lined the walls as dim, flashing green lights pulsated on and off in a rhythmic pattern. Some of these lights were, however, broken, for the struggle from outside definitely continued within the cramped spaces below. Claw marks, punched-in machines, and of course deceased Decepticons, medical cons to be exact, all torn apart like some massive 
beast had disemboweled their forms. Primus, Balmy mumbled as he quickly moved ahead. I knew the stories of Grimlock and his crew described them as brutes, but this is something else. They're barbarians. That much is certain. R.C. mumbled as the two slowly trucked their way through the lab. The broken down facility was eerily quiet, with the only sounds of Bombi and R.C.'s footsteps echoing through its corridors. As the Autobots explored the abandoned facility, they couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The walls were coated in energon and dense while the air was sharp and musty. R.C. led the way, her optics scanning the area for any signs of danger. Bumblebee followed closely behind, his weapons at the ready. The two Autobots moved cautiously as well, their sensors alert for any movement. As they turned a corner, R.C. stopped suddenly, her optics zooming in on something in the distance. Bumblebee followed her gaze and saw what looked to be like a large metallic pod lying on the ground. Looks like someone was experimenting here. R.C. remarked, walking past the strange device. The further they ventured the more strange it got. Electronic chains dangled from above, being hot-wired to the ceiling and the walls, forming some kind of bioelectric web formation. Monitors jutted from control decks and all other makeshift contraptions, all were either off or online to varying degrees. Small insecticons crawled like rats below the bot's feet, skittering and clicking in disgusting tones, making R.C. shiver. She was never a fan of insecticons, the worst of which were the massive bot-sized one, she thought to herself. The further they went, the Autobot duo soon found themselves traversing through what felt like multiple tunnels of similar devices. Low lights, short-circuiting equipment, it all felt so wrong. Looks like the cons have been busy, Balmy stated as he trudged on ahead. RC held her mouth shut, now moving along a gated flooring that had been stained by the rusting waters below. She scanned the walls and electronics with her visor, seeing that all the equipment was either months to a few weeks old. This place, she thought, was some kind of ever-expanding Decepticon facility. But for what? RC, check this out! Balby shouted from around a corner, just a ways ahead. Hearing this, RC quickly turned and moved on, curious to what the little guy was suddenly ecstatic about. As she turned around the corner, the Autobot stopped in shock at what she was seeing. Before her very optics was a massive titan-sized tunnel chute with heavy amounts of flowing water below them. There were elevated platforms all around that connected the one big stationary area that had what seemed to be several elevators built into its frame. Each platform looked to rise at an upper or lower floor, possibly into the towers above or even further below. However, that wasn't the main focus within this vast technological area, for atop the stationary platform was what looked to be a massive testing ground. A supercomputer of sorts lay within its front with several tubes and cables connecting to the ceiling above. It all emanated a low green glow that gave a sense of dread before the two Autobots. It was, for the most part, a massive computer lab, but for what? Together. Both Balmby and R.C. approached the massive computer, towering over them like a metallic mountain in the distance. What is this thing? Balmby asked, his voice tinged with awe and curiosity. It's some kind of massive research station. Stay close. R.C. replied, her tone serious and focused. The two Autobots approached the mainframe cautiously, not knowing what they were about to find or come across. It definitely seemed important. Why would it be underground of all places? As they got closer, the hum of the computer grew louder and more intense, until at last they reached it front and center. Alright, let's see if we can extract any data from this puppy. Could be useful for any future endeavors. R.C. stated as she transformed her hand into an adapter-like spike. Wait, do you even know how the heck? B. asked as he looked to his surroundings worried that Decepticons may be around any corner. I was a data finder before the war. It's kind of my thing. R.C. replied as she shoved her hand into the computer's power router. In reaction, 
The antenna connected to her helmet shimmered with a green glow as the screen turned on and began to sort through files upon files of information. B watched on as RC downloaded these files in vast masses and evading alert codes like a pro, when suddenly, a holographic image appeared before them, showing a map of the galaxy. The galaxy they were in was what the Cybertronians called the Lunar Eon. It was a swirling body of stars that had a bright blue outline that slowly ended in a milky white swirl in its center. However, within the Lunar Eon were several red marks near Cybertron. What? What is this? Balby asked, peering at the image intently. Squinting her eyes, R.C. turned the dial more and expanded the scope upon what they were looking at. After coursing through the deeper ends of the files, they found it. R.C.'s eyes widened in horror at what they had found. The file depicted the Allspark being connected to these red dots. Dots that were planets teeming with energon and life. As a line of text appeared, it all made sense to what this was. The Allspark. The Decepticons were going to use the Allspark to terraform planets into resources and to grow and expand their army. The two fell silent and still as the weight of this reality came crashing down like a mountain slide. Bombi's spark sank within his chest and RZ held back a gasp of shock. That can't be good. Bombi mumbled as he walked up alongside RC. No, no, this is far from good. B, contact Optimus. We need to... R.C.'s words were cut short, however, as the sound of one of many elevators began to hum from above. Realizing that danger was imminent, R.C. quickly retracted her hand and powered off the oversized computer. Balmby at the same time looked to his side, noticing a cluster of junk the two could hide behind. Turning back to R.C., the young scout quickly grabbed her by the hand and propelled them forward in the other direction. With quick steps, the two Autobots hurtled the junk and scooted their backs to its clustered walls. All the while, listening as the elevator slowly descended further and further to the main platform below. Looking to one another, R.C. raised one of her fingers up to her mask and made a hushing motion towards the scout. B in return nodded as the two of them listened closely for who or what was going to exit through the elevator doors. With a slow and eerie release of steam, the elevator shaft doors opened to their sides, casting in a bright yellow glow that illuminated the dimly lit green area. There then came the sounds of heavy footfalls, slow and rhythmically paced between each clank upon the floor. It was two pairs of them, both steady and firm. Knockout? Have Grimlock and the others been successfully encapsulated? A monotone-sounding vocalization asked into the echoing chamber. Yes, they tore up some worker drones, but they've been put in the sleep mode, just as you had asked, your grace. Raising a mechanical eyebrow, Bombi went to turn and peek out over the ledge to see who was talking. Yet, as he went to see, he took notice of R.C., who was now staring forward at the wall, being eerily still. Although her mask was still activated, B could see her optics beneath, wide and full of fear. See? B quietly asked. Good. It's time we enact Experiment Protocol 7-9A. The cold voice continued again. Turning his attention towards it, Bombi took a quick peek at the two beings within the room. There, standing next to the supercomputer, was the sight of a tall and short Decepticon. The short con was a mixture of reds and greys. His body looked sharp and oddly clean for being within a war. He had a pointed scalp and a set of claw-like fingers upon his hands. Worst of all was the handsome yet devilish smirk upon his face as he looked upon the taller con, in which Balmby recognized immediately, making his spark sink yet again. The other con was tall and fit. She had long arms and legs that were built for battle. The right arm had a large scalpel-like blade protruding from the upper build, whereas the left was 90% blaster. A massive purple glowing cable ran from the weapon's end all the way into the Decepticon's back. She was donned in a mixture of light blues, purples, and grays that all ended at the top of a rectangular box-shaped head. This head was donned with horns and one singular blood-red eye within its center. This was no ordinary Decepticon. 
This was Megatron's lead medic and scientist. This was Shockwave. With their reconstructed forms, we'll have the perfect weapons to tear through any Autobot soldier, in turn destroying them with quick incineration. If not, their newly adapted bodies will be highly durable in battle. This is fact. Shockwave elaborated with sharp, bone-chilling detail. I will be in communication soon, Knockout. I expect to hear a feedback report within the next few hours. Do not be late. Shockwave then finished as she walked to another elevator, entered, and then proceeded to descend even further into the lab all the while staring Knockout down with her singular, threatening eye. Yeah, yeah. Freak. Knockout then said with an uneased vocal tone as the elevator shut. He himself then turned and walked his way out the massive room, entering through another door and leaving the two Autobots alone once again. Ah, <sighs> Primus, that was a close one. Wouldn't you say, see? See? Bumblebee quietly asked as he looked back to his companion. Yet, as he laid his eyes upon her, Bumblebee could see that something was wrong. Very wrong. Arcee was still staring forward. However, she was now shaking and quivering. Her left hand was placed upon the floor while the right was clutched upon her chest. Her breathing was quick and short, a rapid succession of hyperventilating breaths. The eyes behind the visor were now wider than ever before, and although the glow ever so slightly hid them, Balby could see the bright blue hues of tears rolling down her cheeks. R.C.? B asked again as he gave his full attention towards her. She didn't even acknowledge the scout. It looked as though she was in her own sense of the world in the worst way imaginable. It was then B connected the dots. R.C. was having some kind of panic attack, a bad one at that. See! B exclaimed again as he scooted towards her while on his knees. His wings flustered in worry as he reached his hand out and then gently shook Arcee's shoulder. She remained unfazed. Whatever was going on within her head was something that had to be terrible. Balmy had seen other bots suffer with anxiety along with PTSD. It was sadly common among many within their ranks, but never had he been trained to help with it. He wasn't sure what to do. See, see, calm down. Look at me. Balby pleaded as he gripped upon her shoulders. R.C. looked lost, her eyes staring right through the scout as whatever memory she had played in her mind like a never-ending cassette tape. What caused this? B asked himself. Was it shockwave? Knockout? R.C. R.C. B cried out again as he tried to deactivate the battle mask-like helmet around her face. He then took notice of the fog of her breath, beginning to engulf the interior of the mask, completely covering the visibility of C's eyes. Instinctually, B reached out and attempted to take the helmet off, but the mask guard latched it to the bottom of her chin, making it practically unmovable. Scrap! RC! RC, please! It's, it's okay! I, I'm here! S snap out of it! Balby pleaded once more as he held the sides of his partner's head, once again gently shaking. R.C. in response continued to hick and silently sob underneath the visor, not responding and being stuck within a traumatic memory. Balby sat there for a long moment, trying to think. What could he do? What could he say? Come on, B. Think. Think! He screamed within his mind as he gripped the top of his horned head. Until at last, an idea came to mind. Eyes perking wide, Balby looked to R.C. and then down at his chest plate idea coming to light. He wasn't sure if it would work, but it was worth a shot. Quickly reaching upwards, B flicked a small dial that was barely visible on his chest plate. His interior then began to slightly shift as his vent mouth spun and formed into a speaker-like shape. With a deep breath, Balmby then did the only thing he could think of. Through the speaker of his mouth, emanated the one noise he thought could help. He played a tune, the same tune that R.C. was listening to back on the plane. Looking on with worried eyes, Balby watched as R.C. continued to hyperventilate as the first few seconds of the tune began to play. 
Looking down to her twitchy hand, B instinctively reached out and gently held onto it. The scout wasn't sure why he did so, for it was an innate instinct he had. Bumby cranked the volume up just a bit, desperately hoping it would break Arcee out of this sudden attack. And so, he closed his eyes, silently pleading for her to relax. Yet, as the tune carried on, the shaking, the heavy breathing, the pouting, it all soon came to a slow and eerie halt. Arcee's breath became docile and shaken as her twitchy movements ceased. Slowly opening his eyes, Balmy watched in relief as R.C. then looked from side to side, snapped back into reality. It was then B. felt the gentle grasp of her hand wrapping around his in a strained state. Until at last, R.C. finally locked eyes with B. herself. R.C.? B. asked with worry. A still moment of silence passed between the two of them as they searched for answers. Just two scouts in a sewer of horrors both lost and frightened by what had just happened. It was then R.C. did something that B. hadn't expected her to do. With a slow shift, the front part of R.C.'s helmet began to transform and retract back into her head. First went the mouth guard that retracted into her cheeks, and then the orange visor that slowly slid to the top of the helmet. The face that looked back at B. was what he could only describe as beautiful. Arcee's face was slick, smooth, and filled with tons of small freckles. Her eyes were large, gorgeous, and blue, shimmering with what almost looked to be stars within them. Her nose was small, and her mouth was quivered into a frown. Blue tears seemed to almost be melting from her eyelids as she stared at Balmby with her true self, one that wasn't locked away behind a mask. Before Balmby could say anything, Arcee leaned forward and pulled the small scout into a tight but shivering embrace. I... Thank you. R.C. quietly thanked while trying to hold back more sobs. Hugging back, Bombi sighed with relief as the much larger Autobot gripped him like a teddy bear. What, what happened? Why did you... Why did you enter the shutdown? What... R.C., are, are you okay? was all B could ask as the two remained in place, latched around one another. I'm sorry. Shockwave... She took Tailgate from me. She took everything from me. R.C. sadly explained as she gripped B tightly. My home, my family... She put it to the ground, all of it. But she left me alive. I don't know why. I'm sorry. I know it's pathetic for me to... I know I'm weak. I know I can't do anything right. I'm a coward. R.C. I... Balmy interrupted as he pulled away, however, still holding her hand, but now placing his other on top of it. You... You don't need to apologize for any of this. Be explained as he and R.C. locked optics. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to cry. I... I, I would know. B explained as he looked to the ground with a saddened expression. Just, just because we're soldiers, it, that doesn't mean we need to hide ourselves. Hide our fears, our traumas. Because if there's one thing I've learned about being an Autobot, is that we're stronger together. As Optimus said, we're, we're family now. We gotta look out for one another. B finished as he gently stood to his feet, bringing R.C. up with him. R.C. couldn't help but keep focus on Bumblebee's face. The look of compassion was ever-present within his giant glowing eyes. We promised to watch out for each other's backs, remember? That doesn't just mean in battle, at least to me. If you ever need anyone to talk to, you can come to me, okay? R.C.'s spark then began to beat at a rapid pace, engulfing her with a feeling she hadn't sensed in a very long time. A feeling that she couldn't sense to be true or not. It was then the two realized the vast height difference while looking at one another. Upon this realization, they began to softly chuckle to one another. R.C. didn't need to say anything in return, but only could see she understood. With a quick wipe away of her tears, R.C. took a deep breath and nodded. If Balmby had a proper mouth, 
he'd be smiling. All right. Let's go find those gladiators. He finished as the two narrowed their optics towards one of the large elevators, as Grimlock's and his team's ping was now louder than ever before. With a sharp slide and clank, the elevator doors opened up into a deeper, more robust sector of the Decepticon lab. More wires and dangling threads of parts made way for the both of them to see, as Energon leaked from the cracks above, being accompanied by water and steam. The air density was thicker here, clammy and musty. Ignoring this, Bombi and RC quietly made their way through the monotone green-colored room, the sound of their robotic footfalls echoing off the rotting metallic walls. Balby led the way, his blasters at the ready, while RC scanned the area for Grimlock and his crew. They were right on top of it now. The tracker was practically going off the radar. A series of loud and annoying beeps went on and off with rapid pace as they made their way through. Turning, they rounded a corner, walked down a liminal corridor, and then through one busted open doorscape. RC then stopped within her tracks, her sensors detecting the warrior's presence up ahead. Balby then followed her gaze. Within the back of this room was another glow, a low, beckoning color that felt as though it called them forth. Slowly, they approached, steps in sync. Soon and when the ominous hue came into focus, the two stopped dead still. Within a circular pattern were large test tubes, five in total. Three were cracked and empty, while the remainders were filled with a heavy amount of disgusting green liquid. With curiosity in their sparks, the two Autobots approached the strange capsule-like devices, their lime-like colors casting an ominous feel upon the both of them. To the last, they came as close as they could, now only being separated between a guardrail. R.C.? B asked as he leaned in close to the liquid-filled chambers. Doing the same as the scout, R.C. squinted her optics as there was seemingly something within both of them. What in Primus's name? R.C. quietly mumbled as she got as close as one could be. It was then they both realized what they were looking at, causing a cold chill to rush through both of them. Shades of red, silver, and gold glimmered back from behind the glass. Skeletal frames, disjointed bodies, mutilated, dissected, and torn apart shells being wired to the top and floating within some makeshift acid. It was hard to tell but there were labels at the bottom of the capsules that gave the two bots all the answers they needed. All five capsules had their own unique names. The two activated ones were both name-tagged as Sludge and Snarl, while the empty and shattered ones were labeled as Swoop, Slug, and Grimlock. What is this? Balby mumbled in horror as the melted deceased face of Sludge bumped into the glass causing his pain scheme to stick upon its clear frame. The two warriors looked to have been almost surgically operated on. Metal rods and pins jutted out of their forms that soon sparked and glitched. Surges of orange electricity buzzed across their lifeless forms, making the corpses seem as though they may have been partially alive. Wh what the hell? R.C. muttered in sheer shock and horror at the sight of her fellow Autobots. Looking around, Balby caught wind of strange illuminated screens that were attached to the devices. On their feeds were shapes of what appeared to be... bones. Alien-looking bones that didn't seem to be native for Cybertron. The skeletal diagnostics were in weird and odd shapes. For Sludge, the skeleton was a creature with a very long neck that stood upon all fours. For Snarl, it was yet another creature that seemed to be a quadruped. However, had spines all along its back, with a sharp-ended tail with four large daggers at its tip. Grimlock's swoops and sludge's screens were online, but without being inside their capsules, the images weren't shown properly, being just a glitched-out screen with no real shape or identification. What were they doing here? Balby mumbled as he and RC looked from one another with dread in their optics. You are in a restricted area. Put your hands behind your heads and get on the ground. Freezing like deer in headlights, both Bumblebee and RC lifted their hands up 
and place them behind their heads, realizing they had been caught. Silently, within a slow turn, the two narrowed their optics towards who had exactly found them. Standing right behind them was a slightly tall and buff-built Decepticon. His colors consisted of dark purples and grays that seamlessly fused as one. He had a pair of handcuffs on his left-hand side, along with a Decepticon badge up front upon his chest. The brow upon his head flustered into a look of annoyance then, as the Decepticon released a sigh. Officer Barricade, what are the likes of you doing in this dump? Balby asked with a sudden sarcastic tone of voice. B-127, of course. Why does it always gotta be you? Barricade grumbled as he aimed his blaster at the scout's forehead. Why does it always have to be you who's on my tailpipe? B returned with unamused eyes. Looking between the Decepticon officer and her partner, RC quietly spoke to the small bot, curious to the strange relationship he and the con seemed to share. I'm assuming you two have bad blood? She asked as Barricade activated another blaster and aimed it at her face. <laughs> oh yeah! Me and old Barricade here go way back. Be revealed as he locked eyes with the Decepticon law enforcer. For the war, when I was on my weekends, I would always go drive drifting. You know, just having some fun. And the amount of times that this aft hat came up and tried to arrest me was ridiculous. He doesn't even know the first meaning of fun. With an anchored huff, Barricade got close to Balby, now just narrowly putting the barrel of his blaster to the scout's chin. Driving near populated areas going 80 miles per hour isn't what I would call fun. You could have hurt innocent people, bug. Barricade snapped as he gritted his teeth into a snarl. A Decepticon caring for innocent people? <sighs> what a joke. RC tagged in with an annoyed vocal tone as she eyed Barricade, who snapped a hard look in her direction. And who are you exactly? Barricade growled as he rose his other blaster to RC's face. RC, with an unamused stare, gazed in the Barricade's optics, seeing a red flare within what almost seemed to be a hint of blue deep within. This, oddly enough, confused her, as the slight hints of red and blue mixed to form a slight purple shade. In that moment, Bombi looked from the two of them, and then to RC's hand that was rested behind her head, watching as she activated some kind of device. It was then she glanced to B, and then back to Barricade, and then simply smirked. Someone who's on the right side. She said with a grin, while the small device quietly fell from her arm plate. The second it dropped, Barricade took notice, and yet before he could act, there was nothing but blur. With a bright light and gust of air, Bulby realized that the small device was in fact a smoke bomb. With a hiss, the bomb released a warm low of red exhaust into the room, completely blindsiding the Decepticon cop, and giving the chance of escape for the two Autobots. Before Balby could react, RC quickly took him by the hand and began sprinting back towards the way they came. RC, activating her battle mask, used its radar to evade through the chemicals that continued to expand at a rapid rate. Whoa! Wait, RC, what about- They're dead, B! We gotta get out of here and get those plans back to Prime! RC barked as they returned to the elevator. But what about Gridlock and the other two? B asked with a quick breath as he looked behind himself. Chances are they're dead too. If they're still alive, we'll have to find them another time. RC returned as she slammed the elevator door, proceeding to rise back up to the surface. <sighs> okay, uh, Operation Escape Plan, got it. B replied as the two quickly ascended while Barricade Below began to give chase, and drinking to another elevator and following behind. As the elevator doors slid open, both Balby and RC found themselves entering back out into the storm-ridden city. The wind howled and lightning struck as they quickly exited to the open. The storm had gotten worse. The rain felt like sharp needles stabbing upon the Autobots' forms. The lightning was sporadic, almost seizure-inducing, as the duo made quick work towards an old city roadway. <sighs> Jetfire, this is B. Pick us up, like, stat! The small scout asked as he pressed the side of his headplate. Did you find those old brutes? Jetfire asked in a shaken breath. B tried to find his words, only mustering a quick... Not, not exactly. Through the harsh rain, there came a sound, 
a loud, echoing noise from above that caused the bots to turn and look upward. From one of the tower's middle floors, they watched as its glass window shattered with a sharp blast of purple and red. They both knew it was barricade. An alarm began the blare then. The gig was up. Whoever or whatever was still in the city knew that they were there. Knowing that there was no other option at hand, Bulby and RC looked to one another and silently agreed. Better make it quick, Jets. Like, real quick. RC stated as she pat B's shoulder and quickly transformed. Without saying another word, Bulby transformed as well and quickly followed behind, the two now entering to the vast dangers of the typhoon-like storm. Leaping from the tower above and landing with a hard splash, Barricade watched the two teens roar ahead, their taillights being the only visible thing within his sights. Snarling, the bad cop took a lunge forward, transforming with a set of clangs, before reverting into a slick, smooth vehicle with two emergency lights at the top that flashed red and purple, all being topped with the sharp sting of a siren. The streets were shrouded in darkness. The rain almost made these roads feel like thick puddles that made their acceleration slow. Minus a setback, both Bulby and RC sped down the Forgotten Highway, their engines roaring as they fled from Barricade, who was quickly growing hot on their trail. If they were taken out or captured, it was game over for the Autobots. They needed the information on the Allspark if they wished to survive. Come on, C. We need to lose this guy. Bulby yelled into his comms as he swerved through traffic, trying to shake Barricade off the trail. Clearly, but he's gaining on us. Arcee replied, her voice crackling over the radio. The three vehicles streaked through the city, weaving in and out of rubble and dead Cybertronians as they raced towards the outskirts. Bulby and RC made sharp turns and sudden stops, trying everything to outrun their pursuer. Barricade, however, was a skilled driver, and he managed to keep up with them at every turn and swerve they tried to throw at him. Suddenly, Barricade's backside transformed into a minigun and fired a series of sharp bullets at the fleeing duo. Bulby and RC swerved and ducked, narrowly avoiding the dagger-like bullets as they continued their mad dash. We gotta shake him! You down for some fun? Bulby asked as he glanced at RC through his mirror. With a flash in her headlights, the two Autobots tried to recollect and soon began to work together. With a pulse in her engine, RC rocketed ahead of Bumblebee, drawing Barricade's attention and forcing him to focus on her. As Barricade closed in upon the red vehicle, RC suddenly shifted gears with a loud screeching swerve. Then, with yet another elegant form of motion, she launched herself up with a transformation, all ending with her landing gracefully on the roof of Barricade's vehicle mode. What's in Primus's name? The Decepticon cop shouted as RC activated her blades and stabbed them upon his roof trying to create an opening or weak spot. However, Barricade was already thinking one step ahead. The police bot suddenly shifted his own gears, proceeding to drift and swerve from left to right, trying to throw RC off his form. B, upon seeing this, transformed half his body. His head poked out of the front of his engine hood, while his right arm appeared out of the right wheel. Scowling, the scout contorted his free hand into his blaster and began firing at Barricade's rear. This forced the Decepticon to lose his balance for a brief moment, in turn giving RC ample time to aim and shoot at the weakened hatch. With a loud crack, RC shot the broken piece of metal, burning and melting it away. Reaching down with both hands, she took hold of its broken frame and managed to pry it open. She then looked into the opening and saw the red optics of the Decepticon glaring back at her, burning with rage. Before Barricade could make a move, B transformed his other arm out and shot a grappling hook, snagging one of Barricade's rear wheels. Then with a mighty heave, B pulled hard, sending Barricade spinning out of control as the wheel's rubber end popped like a balloon. The Decepticon yelled in pained rage as this all happened within moments. And at the same time, from ahead, soared in the blurry shape of Jetfire who began to lower himself further up ahead. See ya, Scruphead! <laughs> RC cried with a smirk, as she flipped off Barricade's hood, transforming back and zooming ahead. For extra measure, Bulby reverted his form back into his vehicle mode, but activated the drill attached to his bumper. The scout then rushed forward and rammed right in the barricade, causing the Decepticon to flip over completely and tumble across the road. See you around, Barry! Bulby cried with a laugh as he got up alongside RC. Slowly, Jetfire lowered himself to the ground, the back hatch into his plane mode opening before skidding along the ground. Together, the two Autobots floored it, going as fast as their tires could carry. 
Then together, they transformed, launching themselves into the hangar of Jetfire's body. The two crashed and rolled until they found themselves upright and alive. When all said and done, Jetfire closed the hatch and took off. Looking to one another, Bombi and RC locked optics. The two sets of bright blue glowing eyes seemingly entranced like a fusion of light. In that moment, the two bots both blushed ever so slightly, the robotic cheeks warming up with a gentle green haze. RC simply smiled while Bombi mustered a relieved but gleeful expression. It was the best he could do for not having a mouth. Without saying a word, R.C. sighed and rose her fist up, now gesturing for Balby to give a fist bump like he did with her earlier. Getting all giddy, Balby quickly fist bumped back. For the first time in years, the Autobots found comfort. Minus what they had seen, what they learned, and what had happened, the two found themselves to be optimistic for once. Optimistic with a now kindled friendship. Boy, what you two find down there? Jetfire asked the two bots that sat within, making them realize just how much they had truly discovered. Two of Grimlock's crew, dead. Three possibly still alive, in the plans for galaxy rule. Looking to one another, the two bots gave uneasy stares before simply heading to the main deck within Jetfire. There was much to explain. Standing within the rain, damaged and tired, Barricade watched as the outline of Jetfire faded to the sky. Although angered, there was a part of him that felt guilty. Something wasn't right. He had always felt it, but now it seemed as though some sins were catching up to him. Reaching down to his badge, Barricade plucked it off and stared into its golden frame. The Decepticon insignia glinted within the lightning, reflecting the Khan's face back into his soul. Protect and serve, it said in big bold letters. But protecting and serving what? Barricade questioned. The right side, he kept telling himself, as Arseed's words chimed like a bell within his head. Hey! Hey! Turning, Barricade watched his knockout caught up to him, breathing heavily like he had run the whole way. Why did you let them get away? He asked in a clearly angered tone. Looking from knockout and then back to his badge, Barricade grumbled before he promptly placed it back upon his chest. With a huff, he turned, shouldering Knockout as he walked past him. They're... They're just kids. Barricade replied with a conflicted tone of voice. Autobot kids! What makes you... Hey! Transforming, Barricade reverted back into his vehicle mode, promptly revving his tires and splashing Knockout with mud before he could even finish. Then, without a care in his spark, Barricade blasted off, heading back to the city. Groaning in a petty voice, Knockout tried to wipe the mud off his body, but only smeared it in the process. He cringed and winced as he felt it crusting and leaking into his panel lines. Knockout hated being dirty and unsanitary. He was a doctor, but even he had limits. My paint job. He mumbled with a depressed-sounding voice. Shockwave's gonna kill me.